the next speaker I'm really excited is James Peacock from the Anne Boleyn Society. So I got this biography off of your LinkedIn profile. And so since 2014, you have led the Anne Boleyn Society, which is, and you've founded and led the Amblin Society, which is an online community with over 20,000 followers, and it exists to celebrate the life and legacy of Queen Anne Boleyn and promote her influence on the shaping of British history. And that society aims to discuss and debate the life and times of both Anne while taking into account the period in which she lived. So I'm really interested to start with, how did you get into Anne Boleyn? How did this come about for you? Oh gosh, that, do you know what? That, it started when I was very, very young. My interest in history kind of grew as a young child. I remember um, visiting certain locations like the Tower of London, Hever Castle and stuff. And I just found that the, the Tudor period in general, I found fascinating. Mm. But there was something in particular about Anne Boleyn that I always found so intriguing. And I was quite young when I watched the film Anne of a Thousand Days and that just tipped the interest for me. That was just the big, that was like the, the big start for me. I just absolutely, from then on, had this real interest in this woman who came across so strong, so intelligent, so determined um, and so passionate and has this incredible story about her. Um, but also just kind of, and I could tell from quite a young age reading books that she was judged so differently depending on who was writing the book or something. And it was just made me more and more intrigued about her. You know, there were some parts that you'd read that or would find out that she wasn't, um, well, she couldn't or she didn't always come across as the easiest person. Um, but other parts you'd read that she came across very much like a very kind and generous person. And that is one of the things that drew me to her um, and has kind of been the interest ever since, really. And what I find still fascinating about her is because she comes across as human. You know, so, so many characters you read about in history, they come across quite one dimensional. But with her, she comes across a lot more real and I think that that to me is where the the interest has always been mm, yeah and it's interesting because you talk about the people either love her or that they, they, it's kind of it's hard to have it's yeah. hard to go middle of the ground middle of the road man uh, one of the articles that I saw that you had written was like bitch Anne versus like <laughs> thing um and I wonder like what tell me about what your opinion of that is um uh, well I I think to be honest, I I can imagine from her perspective, you know, trying to put yourself into the, her into their. I think it's always important, as you probably do yourself when you're reading about these um, these people, you kind of put yourself into their perspective and think, okay, well, how would they have felt? How mu how you know what must they have thought of this, and how frustrating this sort of thing must have been? And I think for Anne, she comes across as someone who shows her emotions, you know, someone who, some people could say someone who had a very loose tongue at times, but you can tell when she had pretty much, you know, like situations like with her stepdaughter Mary, for example, mm -hmm. that was not an easy relationship. And you can tell that when she would try and um, reach out to Mary and Mary understandably would knock her back because you know she obviously did not see um Anne Boleyn as the queen she was very much siding with her mother and you can understand how for Anne that would be you know she wouldn't she couldn't control her emotions on that part and that's what I, I think is so interesting about her so you get this side that she doesn't always come across particularly easy and quite temperamental at times but then you get this side to her where you hear stories about her charity and her generosity and how she looked after certain people who were exiles from abroad um who were interested in the reformation um mm. her interest in in the poor um her interest in you know charity in general which is just so it's so interesting and and i think you know no one no one is a saint no matter what and i don't believe in saints and i think that's one of the reasons why i like Anne is because you when you read about her you you really do get this sense that she was a real person mm -hmm. yeah she was almost human huh yes exactly <laughs> go figure i know <laughs>
<laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because sometimes people want to lump her into or want to call her a, a feminist. And I always kind of hesitate to put these kind of modern concepts on people that wouldn't have had that kind of vocabulary and wouldn't have had those kinds of kind of thoughts. What do you think about her in terms of like a feminist or not? Um, I can see why people today look at her as a role model for for feminists or female leadership, a bit similar um, to her daughter, Elizabeth, and to an extent as well, Mary, Mary the First mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I am, like you said, I'm very hesitant to kind of um, put that sort of, um, give her that title because that wasn't a title that existed in her time. And mm -hmm. I think she, I, I can see why people feel that she, is ahead of her time in some ways, but I do, I think she's very much of her time. And I think she's the product of um, this um, education experience she'd had out on the continent at the courts of like Margaret of Austria and then at the court of France, when she'd been surrounded by these strong influential women. And of course then becoming queen and being crowned almost like a monarch rather than a consort. And I think really she's very much of her time and she's working within the, you know the boundaries of her time really yeah. yeah yeah it's it's interesting i want to talk about that early educational experience and also ties in with this summit because one of the other speakers is danielle the five minute medievalist talking about christine pizan who oh. um would have perhaps her writings would have been yeah. at the court of margaret of austria and her writings are again something people try to say is feminist or not or you know there's the debate over her and i guess i i want to ask you about this kind of early education that anne had at the court of margaret of austria and surrounded by these powerful queens of of the continent um and i can you just talk to me a little bit about her her early role models in that respect yeah i think i mean i feel that that i feel quite strongly that that has had that was her big impact really. I mean going to the court of Margaret of Austria, this woman who had been married a few times, had turned down suitors and was ruling as regent for her, you know, for, you know, and then you go to, um, well sorry, then Anne goes to France and obviously she's at the court of France and you've got Marguerite of Angoulême and Louise of Savoy, so you've got these powerful figures who are very much involved in politics and the governments of these countries. And even then when she comes back to England, she you've got Catherine of Aragon who, um, uh, okay, it was a number of years before that, but before Anne came back, but she was ruling as regent whilst Henry was away. So you've got, mm -hmm. so she's got these influences to go on for herself and mm -hmm. I think that that would have had a such a strong it, you you know obviously we don't know what conversations would have taken place between her and these women and everything but they it, you, you can't deny that they must have had a huge well they did have a huge impact on her and who she became yeah yeah and this was such an interesting period in terms of education for women in general it seems like there was this kind of height of learning for women during this period and even you talked about with Catherine of Aragon and the way she um, coordinated her daughter's education and it was this odd humanistic thing yeah. that later on you don't yeah. see under the Stuart Kings and earlier you don't see and she was of age right during the, the height of that yeah. and uh, a lot of value on that what kind of stuff do you think she was reading at these at these places and and how do you think like I think about the religious texts too that she had access to yeah. what kind of tell me about like what kind of books and authors do you, can you tell me anything about what she would have been what her influences would have been like that Good. well we I mean you can you it's obvious that her love of manuscripts and you know courtly love and things would have started at these courts um for example and she must have read um works of christina um and and others i'm um but yeah they must i mean she would have yeah sorry i'm stumbling a bit <laughs> it's fine i just kind of threw that out there but even like the early reformation works that wouldn't have made it to england yet she would have had access to that yeah. and yeah. she would have 
probably been able to read it even as a woman yeah. because she was with these powerful women, right? Yeah, and you yeah. know, she, it, it could have been when she first came across uh, Tyndall, um, the priests like that, and I, you know, it's tempting to imagine her at like one of the um, gatherings of Marguerite of Angoulême and, and the discussions there, um, okay. and with her sharp intellect, which she had, you can't, you can't, it's, it would just be, it just feels so wrong for her to think her not being part of that. Obviously, you know, she was a lady in waiting and, you know, Margaret von Galen is the sister of the King of France, but you kind of think, and especially from like um, letters from one time that Anne is queen and how she wished she'd meet Marguerite again and stuff, there must have been some relationship. So she mm -hmm. must have been involved and read the exact works that would have been in the library of Marguerite and even earlier Margaret of Austria I mean this seems to be when she really came up this was like her coming of age period um and she it, it just feels that you know she must have read all this like stuff that hadn't made it over to England I mean because we know that when she came back to England and when she um to, you know first appeared at court she was completely different to all the other English ladies she stood out for her dress sense her intellect her you know her I'm struggling to find the word now but her you know her, je ne sais quoi yes exactly yeah <laughs> that seems to be her you know she so yeah it's just it's a fascinating time really yeah mm, <laughs> yeah um so what as you research and what has been your biggest kind of eye-opening discovery or kind of something that you had maybe believed about her that then when you found out something different surprised you or tell me a little bit about like how your relationship to her evolved and mm. yeah I think um for, I think for me what I'm and still very much learning more now one of my um, big interests is her role in the reformation and it's something I'm starting to delve deeper into now because I really want to sort of understand that a bit more and stuff and the reformation in itself and I think um that in particular her the more you read about it and you read about her connections to people like Cranmer and um other bishops and everything who were lead who were very big figures in the reformation how they were very much part of her support faction and then you hear about stories like one of my favorites is the story of Hales Abbey while she and Henry were staying at Sudley Castle and she um it was her really who investigated who initiated the investigation into the supposed holy relic uh, that was there and you know so stuff like that which never really gets touched on never gets mentioned and it's such a shame because I think that's her role in that is so underplayed yeah, yeah. and then also once the reformation had been set in motion almost um her the relationship with uh, Cromwell falling apart because of going too far in a sense like with dissolving all the monasteries yeah. Yeah, indeed. And I think that's another thing. People, um, similar to the feminist title, people often label her very quickly as a Protestant. But back then, the lines between Catholic and Protestant were not as clear and distinct as they would later become. Who knows what would have happened had she lived um, another 10, 20 years. But I, that's another thing I'm slightly hesitant, you know, when people start giving her that title, because obviously, you know, we have to look at, but I, I think more of an evangelical as stuff is probably the better way to describe her. And I think, you know, that's, that's an interesting one is her, her religion and well, the religion of the time, really. Mm -hmm. um, formation is still in its very early stages yeah yeah definitely it's like you, they didn't have the understanding of protestant catholic mm. it was like transubstantiation and the miracle of the mass and, yeah. and like where do you fall on those lines but it wasn't necessarily yeah. i'm a protestant I'm a, yeah. yeah yeah interesting she definitely had such a role with that though it was almost like this perfect storm wasn't it with her oh, it's like it's a story you couldn't you couldn't really make up really i mean here's this girl who's not a princess by birth she goes off to the courts of europe uh, she comes back to england she in a few a few years later the king captured she catches the eye of the king and he decides he wants her a mistress but then he wants to marry her and there's this whole turbulent period and then at the end you've got the execution which is a bit like uh, someone once described it as like uh, the story of Arthur and Guinevere, but unlike mm. 
the Guinevere story where she saves at last minute and is executed. And it's that cre incredible kind of, well, how did it all change so quickly? But then about 20 years after that, you've got the story of her daughter coming to the throne and mm. very much defining female monarchs um, mm. forever. And has in, in many respects, and as many people say, she was the most successful of all Henry's children. And, you know, that which just, it's the irony of it all. It's mm -hmm. not the son that he wanted, it's the daughter he had with Anne Boleyn that ended up being one of the most successful monarchs in British history. And I, it's, it's all part of that story that pieces together, which it, it couldn't be, it, it's almost like something that, I don't think if you, if you were writing a, a fictional drama you couldn't even make that sort of stuff up really it's just yeah. incredible yeah yeah, yeah 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 so um going back to to the girl and she's coming home and catching the attention of the king there's a lot of debate around was how her family and her father and did they push her into this role or was she scheming at it yeah. like what do you think about there's even so much people have said like oh she was pimped out and mm -hmm. you know the sisters and stuff like that and yeah. um i'm curious what your opinion is about that and uh, just kind of talking a little bit about how how you think she felt about henry and especially in those early yeah. stages yeah um i I really do feel sorry for Anne's father. I think he gets um, an even worse deal than Anne, really. Um, and I don't think it, I do. F I don't think it's fair when people say that he pimped her out. Um, mm -hmm. Thomas Boleyn was already a very um, successful courtier. He was already riding high in the, at court in favour of the king, um, and. So I don't see why he would want two of his daughters become mistresses. There's even a, um, a report from Chapuis, which I always love to mention, which um, kind of hints that he wasn't actually as entire and never had come out in favour of this whole great matter and the marriage between Anne and Henry, um, or the relationship, I should say, really, between Anne and Henry in the beginning. Um, and I, I think because, you know, you've got this long period that the great matter went on for, and I think from his perspective, there was always that worry of, well, is it actually going to happen? Because there were so many stumbling blocks along the way. And if it didn't happen and the relationship fell apart, he would have had two daughters who would have been the mist discarded mistresses of the king. And that would not have gone down well for him at all. But, and by that stage as well, his daughter Anne would have been, you know, beyond the age of, of the marriage market and everything. She would have been considered old in the Tudor time. So, and he couldn't have then arranged probably a good marriage for her. Um, mm. So I, I do feel quite strongly that I don't agree with the, the famous story that he pimped um, his, da his daughters really out at all. But um, it's, it's such an intriguing one, the whole about Anne coming back, because we know obviously she had marriage contracts and everything which then fell apart. And I certainly think in the early days, probably, you know, that she no doubt would have enjoyed the attention of anybody, you know, anyone would enjoy the attention, especially of a king. Um, and I do, I, I know that there's often, this is where another debate with Anne comes in, because like you said, people either see her as the scheming who set out, set, sets out to become queen, or they see her as, you know, this harassed victim by Henry. Um, I think probably it's somewhere in the middle on that one. I think, um, you know, I don't think she, I, I think, you know, she she certainly wouldn't have wanted to become a mistress like her sister. We know she turned that down. Um, I don't think she would have expected, though, anyone would have expected the king to marry. And I know people often um, kind of put the words into her mouth a little bit that, you know, she then set out to say to him, well, if you make me your wife instead. In those days, obviously, you know, with the hierarchy and everything, you've got God and the king and everyone saw the king as God's anointed and everything, you know, God's God's representative on earth. And I think, you know, I, I kind of feel that that's bordering into the, the feminist title that people think of today a little bit. It's almost like, say, would she have been that daring really to speak to a king like that? I think, you know, possibly she could have 
maybe lost her head a bit sooner or something had she done but equally i think when the when the crown was offered you know who is going to turn that down it's an incredible advancement for herself for her family and i think by that stage you know it, you you can't turn down a, an offer like that it should be yeah 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 so do you think she had any kind of affection for him or like do you think she was ever in love with him or um, was it more like pragmatic it's so it's so frustrating that we don't really have any of her letters and they all seem right. that the replies henry must have been destroyed or lost or something and i think she must have had some affection for him there, there certainly was some evidence that later on that as their relationship was progressing as well that there was some affection returned from her to him and um so i think then there must have been um some affection there in that relationship certainly they worked so closely together they he treated her as an equal and they were constantly in each other's company so i think they must you know i don't feel that it was just um from her point of view it was all the greed and the power um for him i don't think it was the obsession always either i think you know he generally seems to certainly in the early days um you know he he generally seemed to uh, tr appreciate her input and i think you know they were uh, they obviously it's hard because everyone you know you always judge history people do judge history backwards but really they were when you think that they were a great match for each other mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely that on a personal level at least and then that, that kind of gets me and segues nicely into her downfall like obviously you can say the, the really obvious part she had a daughter and then she miscarried and there was that whole stuff and then the the political landscape changing but where do you and then people say about well her personality was great as a mistress but not as a wife and there's a lot of different yeah. elements that go into it but how do you get in three years from marriage and coronation that like it's how do you do that incredible and i think that's one of, that is the reason why her story is so fascinating and why people just i don't think it, there'll ever be a time when her story is not being constantly printed in biographies or um, fiction books or tv dramas or theater plays and stuff because i think everyone wants to everyone wants to put forward their own opinion and research it for themselves and i think i, I mean like you said it's so fascinating it's it's it is just so bizarre and the whole change of the mentality in that um you know people there's all sorts of theories of was it the fact that she she couldn't have a son and there have been miscarriages was it the fact that henry then had this accident and he wasn't of the right frame of mind afterwards um was this plot that was put against her just so convincing and it was seen as a chance to really get her out of the way had she become dangerous. I mean, I, I do feel that one one thing I feel quite strongly of is, um, it's very popular in like the world, in fiction I've noticed really, um, for the relationship to start going wrong after she gave birth to a daughter and not the son that was so promised and so hopeful. But we know from later records, particularly around like the pro, the, royal progress of 1535 but they were very much it seemed like it gone back to the early days again they were very much in love they were very they were constantly together and even reports from chapuis and stuff were stating that you know yes they would argue but then they would passionately make up afterwards mm -hmm. so it's this temperamental relationship but it, i it's i surf it just it seems to have continued it seems to have gone fairly well right up until the last few months if anything um and yeah who knows really what the actual answer is as to why it all goes wrong but i i kind of think and maybe i'm sitting on the fence here a little bit but i kind of yeah. think it, can't, it was this combination of all these things going on her miscarriage um, henry's accidents and then of course the case put against her, her falling out with cromwell um it all must have come together i i think it's too easy to have one answer i think i think there's just when you look at the evidence it just seems like it must have been all these things coming together mm -hmm. that caused it mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about her relationship with cromwell and how that evolved and devolved <laughs> or fell apart <laughs> <then>? <laughs> i th i always feel that anne and cromwell looking at the evidence and well from what i've researched into and um seen they were 
they both come across very similar. Mm -hmm. They both come across as people who stand out a bit more from the from the crowd at court. Both very sharp intellectual. Um, both slightly seem a bit wary of other people and having their own sorts of you know kind of gay their own kind of thoughts and not you know both wanting to be that position of authority and with the king and i think it's it seems certainly in the early days they could work very well together but i do think it seems to have disintegrated um because of their both of their ambitions obviously came to clash they it seems that they were just too similar and i think um it seems to come from them that um it in the end only one of them could survive there was only room for one of them and Cromwell seems to have got in there first it seems yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah um so can you talk to me then a little bit about the history of how she has been portrayed I know you you've written and talked a bit about her portrayal in the media and if you can talk a little bit about kind of how that also has evolved and, and changed yeah. Because yeah. I feel like a hundred years ago, the portrayal of her was different than it is oh, today. Very much, yeah. yeah. It and has evolved with the changing attitudes of times. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, after her execution, you have this period of time where it's almost like it's, she's she's erased or she's forgotten about or if she is mentioned particularly in Mary's reign it's not in a positive light and then of course we've got Elizabeth coming to the throne and her memory is restored um, and that she becomes a lot more celebrated she's the mother of the queen and that's kind of when she suddenly gets transformed into this Protestant hero the Protestant martyr and then over time you've got this um, again this changing evolving you know like the Victorians um, she becomes this romantic victim you know the lady in the tower as it were and everything and there's that romantic side to the story that comes out and then of course you go on later to like the 1960s and Anna the Thousand Days and in the feminist crazed um, it, you can tell that that very much influences the film you know um, Genevieve Bujol's portrayal is phenomenal but you can tell it is very much influenced by the the feminist ideas at the time and of course then it's involved again to slightly um, you know like the mean girls and stuff portrayal and you know the other Berlin girl and everything like that and you know it does it, she has she is definitely someone who has with the changing attitudes of time or what's the what's the view at the time towards women it seems like she's very much it's it has a big influence on how she is portrayed in the in um novels or you know in the media basically really yeah She's almost like a, like a weather vane or something. Oh, it's very large, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, what, what do you think is like, why does Anne deserve her own society? What, why is she worth studying? Why is her story still lingering with us? And, and why, yeah, why does, why does she have her own society? <laughs> Well, the the idea really came about for me around the time of um, the whole announcement that the the bones that were found in the car park in Leicester yeah. were Richard the Third, and um, a shout out here to Sarah Morris, um, who's co-authored the book In the Footsteps of Anne Boleyn, and is currently running the Tudor Travel Guide. Um, I remember on. Uh, a page that she was running at the time she happened to mention well why doesn't Anne Boleyn have a society she would have loads and loads of members and it kind of made me think actually yeah I think she would she would mm -hmm. and I and I thought well and at the time there's no way I could set it up I'd have to work with someone else um, and I thought about it and in the end I remember contacting her and she was ever so supportive and gave wonderful ideas and everything and it kind of just evolved from there and then I decided you know what I will set it up and just see how it goes and mm -hmm. it's it's taken off and I think the you know that kind of yeah so I'm so pleased that that kind of happened really um so that's how it kind of came about and I think that Anne certainly deserves her society because her own society because similar to Richard III you've got these two completely different viewpoints about her and she I do feel she is misunderstood and misrepresented at times and I think it's a chance to 
debate and discuss her life, but also celebrate her role and the fact that she did have this huge impact on history. And I know some people will think that I'm romanticising her a little bit there by doing that. And maybe I am, but I, I, I do very much believe she had a huge role in history and there's so much debate about her and that should continue. Debate about everyone should continue as it, as it does, but there's not much celebrating of all that that goes on and it doesn't get, it's what is not looked at, what is completely ignored is what role she had in history, the impact. And that is something that I'm very passionate about, about bringing out a bit more and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So other than mm, the English church and breaking away from the Pope and um, having her daughter and all of that minor stuff, what is her impact on, on British history? I think she, it seems that she, she had this, I mean, she was such an intelligent woman and she was a huge interest and promoter of the arts and, you know, manuscripts and everything and being involved in that stuff in the politics side of things. And, you know, that's not to say that we hadn't had women and queens before that had done that, but I think she certainly helped set that standard at the time, certainly for consorts. Um, and I think she, she again, that, that's not looked at often, is the fact that she kind of helped, I do feel that she had a role in helping adapt that role, of the role of the consort. And so they weren't just merely a, you know, a sidekick to have babies and produce the heirs and everything. Um, that I feel is something she, you know, she should be celebrated for more and something that yeah. is, should be noted more. Yeah, it's interesting because I've often heard like Catherine of Aragon described as the sort of last medieval queen, as it were, and Anne Boleyn, like the first more modern queen. Yeah. And I don't know that that necessarily always fits because you've got like Eleanor yeah. of and and people yeah. like that, just this, this yeah. idea of the woman as the child bearer and that's her yeah. son, and she's the peacemaker and, and yeah. the child bearer and, uh, and Anne certainly yeah. kicks, uh, she, burst through that in a yeah definitely and like you said there have been um queens queens consoles before that had that certainly weren't just the the peacemaker or the child bearer like you said eleanor of Aquitaine, margaret of anjou and isabella of france you know they, they were these incredible women and she i think helped she was part of she i you have to include you can't not include her in that set of these incredibly intelligent women who had a role in not necessarily in promoting women's interests at the time because that wasn't something of the time but unknowingly i i think it very much seems to have a it helps adapt that and helps to you know which is why people nowadays look back on that and see that as a as a inspiration for what they can continue today and what has continued since really yeah yeah that's and she's kind of like the high point and with elizabeth it really after yeah. her it doesn't really get much better than that it doesn't and like you said, yeah because i mean her daughter obviously goes on to become queen and i always admit this great quote from tracy borman was that elizabeth was able to be the queen that her mother wasn't able to be she was able to take on she seems to have take, been she it had the best of both sides from both her parents um obviously she said she very much modeled herself on her father um which is which was completely the right thing to do. Her father was the king and he was respected. So to do that was just genius, really. But she seems to have taken on the best of both of her parents and adapted that and to become such a successful monarch in her own right. It's, it's incredible. And again, she is another um, figure who, you know, you look to as this incredible, um, incredible monarch and again, set the standard for female monarchs after that, really. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, um, where so that that's a awesome high note to to leave it. <laughs> where can people find out more about you and your work and and just get more involved with the Amberlin Society and with you? Uh, so the Amberlin Society is on Facebook. Um, that is where most of the discussions and everything can take place from there and people can message me at any time through there. Um, I'm also on Twitter um, 
and that is my username is at society underscore am and the same on instagram um same username on that and i'm contactable on all three of those um platforms that's where i post the most on <laughs> um so mainly on facebook and instagram um, more than twitter it seems um that seems to be that's where i'm more you're more likely to be able to contact me on those but yeah if anyone um, wishes to contact me i'm more than happy i regularly will post um book recommendations not necessarily just on Anne, um on the period in general and stuff and yeah i'm always up for a discussion and a debate and everything awesome awesome so you've been so generous with your time and I really have loved speaking with you and I know you, this is probably going to get some big debates started um, when people watch this as well. <laughs> so we'll have fun with that. Um, but thank you so much for, for taking the time and for being so generous and, um, and for sharing so much about Anne with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute honour to be part of this. Thank you. Yeah.